uh, yeah. Online and in your pocket, look at that. And I mean, the UI track, isn't that, that's quaint. Um, so, <clears throat> let's think about the future. You know, we're all enlightened, uh, clever people. We can, we can predict the future, can't we? So, in the future, you know, cloud computing, you know, as everyone knows, will be the only choice. You know, I love those choices where there's only, you know, there's, anyway, no choice. Successful businesses, even, may soon have no chief executive. I think my chief executive has been told this. Um, no headquarters and no IT infrastructure. In fact, they won't exist at all. Um, no, wait a minute. Um, so th this is pretty cool, right? That's the future. Um, right. So, or app stores, the future of desktop applications, right? 300,000 iPhone and iPad apps, 10 billion downloads. 10 billion. That's a big number. Even I know that. Um, Apple has taken the concept of the desktop. It's amazing, isn't it? In the future, there aren't going to be any apps. Oh, right. Yeah. So, what's going to win? I don't know. Who can say? Um, mix and match. Oh, well, yeah. So, um, yeah, SaaS. So, SaaS solves, it solves the deployment problems nicely. You know, you don't want to install this massive piece of software in your, your business because software is impossible to install if it's, it's massive. And, you know, some of these, these web apps, you know, add cool collaborative features enabled by the, the network that they have to use. So, so, that's cool. But they often take these major regressions. Uh, you know, what you see is what you get editing, gone, you know? We, we managed to get out of the text Word, Microsoft Word 5, I don't know if you remember that, you know, the, the text, you couldn't do anything on the console. We got whizzy with editing, and it wasn't it brilliant for 20 years, and now it's going again. Um, offline access, you know, little things like, yeah, when you're on your massive yacht in the middle of the ocean, you know, being able to get to your documents. Um, so, on the other side, you know, these app stores are, are just wildly popular. Everyone's doing them. You know, there's, there's Apple, there's Intel, Amazon, Microsoft, you know, everyone is, is, is app storing. Uh, five million downloads a day, that's pretty good. Firefox is about a million, as I understand it. So, they're, they're doing pretty well. And, you know, we should, we should really, like, invent some way to install software on Linux, you know, where you could, like, have granular packages and suck things from online repositories. That'd be awesome, right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be the breakthrough technology. Anyhow, um, so the other approach, you know, there's these two poles, is to like mash it together. So not only do you have a web app, but you've installed it from a web app store. You know, that's the best of all buzzwords, isn't it? You know, you can, you can cross them all off, web app stores. Um, you know, I'm just installing my web app and, you know, I don't know. Anyhow, so this is the world we live in. And everyone is really, at the end of the day, searching for the magic bullet. How can we do something for nothing? You know, how can we you know, leverage our synergistic something or others, and um, there's lots of magic bullets out there. H here are some I'd like to sell you. You can just get this massive tenfold productivity improvement by using any one of these languages, you know? It's just a mystery to me why no one uses the latest trendy language. Um, and, but particularly if you have a large code base, you can pick a trendy language every few years, and your code base will never move. So you end up with, you know, C, C++, Python, Perl, Java, JavaScript, uh, JavaScript engines written in Java, and then you have LibreOffice. It's wonderful, isn't it? You know, fashion. And, and the great thing is it's so simple. These new languages are amazing. Um, you know, anyway, there you go. If you believe that, you'll believe anything. So actually, it seems to me the only real magic bullet here is code reuse, not writing new code. You know, the best line of code is one you didn't have to write, and you didn't write. You just reused it. And free software is brilliant at this. Free software where you can look in the box, and you can actually get in there, and you can reuse code that you can see is it's just fantastic. I spent um, part of my uh, early uh, youth as a professional engineer um, writing component software. And component software is this brilliant idea that by writing these contracts and interfaces and IDL descriptions and heavily documenting them, that you can produce reusable software blobs. And I'm just totally disillusioned by it. It's all rubbish. So uh, there you go. Don't bother. And, and the proprietary world, of course, has to suffer with this because you, know, you can't look inside the black box. It's nailed shut because you pay for that. And if you looked inside, you'd discover it was all duct tape and baler twine and you wouldn't pay. So you, know, um, you can't even hand the code out. So actually, we get a lot of this right in free software. We really we do well. But the problem is, you know, rewriting is such fun. You know, there are these new languages to learn, an endless supply of them. Supply, you know, Go, uh, Dart. Uh, I don't know, they, they just come constantly, you know, and um, yeah, and, and collaboration is hard, you know, working with other people, why bother doing that? Why, why reuse stuff? It's all old and boring. Well, so I'm interested in office suites because I think office suites are cool. And as you can see by the packed room, obviously, lots of other people agree. Um, so he, here's a quick history of, of failed office suite rewrites. 
which I think is perhaps, perhaps interesting. You've, you've obviously heard of MicroPro. They're the US's largest software company. Uh, yeah, they were. Anyway, in the 80s, they were the biggest company ever. They were the number one office suite, WordStar, brilliant. And then they decided to duplicate their office suite to compete with IBM's display writers. They didn't actually kill the product, because you've still got to sell something, right, to pay all these people and be number one. So they created another one. It was an ex exact functional duplicate with the slight changes, right? And this totally killed the company. They, they fought, there was internal warfare, who should market which, which one goes to trade shows. WordStar 2000 versus WordStar. This was way before 2000. And um, yeah, they just killed it. WordStar 2000 never delivered, it never had the feature set, and it created a poisonous acrimony in the company that killed it. Um, Corel Office. Now there's another leading product in the Office Suite market, absolutely fantastic. And they rewrote in Java, because as everyone knows, all software will soon be run on a Java virtual machine. It's funny, isn't it? How the old failures of yesterday come in as the new, new shiny technologies of today on your mobile phone. But anyway, um, maybe we can actually make this vision happen these days. Um, but this beautiful technology demonstration, they, they trashed their working product, and they re-put all their engineers on, on writing Java technology demos, which were brilliant in 97. You know, the zenith of run the beta in your browser. Isn't that useful? Um, they never shipped a final version, squandered their cash, destroyed their market position. So that's fine. Microsoft tried the same thing, interestingly. They, they, they tried to rewrite Word, and they called it Pyramid. Actually, they tried it several times. And uh, Pyramid has been an attempt to completely rewrite. It's just completely broken. We need to c completely rewrite the thing. And uh, yeah, it was abandoned when they discovered they could just never catch up with themselves. So uh, there you are. Much better to do incremental stepwise refactoring. So not a terribly, terribly new idea, I would suggest. But uh, it's one that's perhaps worth relearning. So I think we have a, a different approach. When I, when I hear this model of, you know, we really need to rewrite the 8 million line office suite in JavaScript, you know, I, I, you know, I love that kind of argument, obviously. It's a full employment you know, methodology. You know, if, if we had a, a, a Soviet state, we could employ hundreds of thousands of intelligent people uh, doing useless work, rewriting it in type unsafe JavaScript and trying to debug it. Um, but if you disagree, that's fine. Go and do it somewhere, somewhere else, um, but uh, just not in LibreOffice. And interestingly, often you, you then have to be online yourself. Currently, most of these suites, in fact, if not all of them, uh, you, you have to be online while you're doing it as well. And even the telcos don't believe you're going to be online all the time. If a telco actually believed you would be online and that their connectivity was any good everywhere, uh, they put all of these apps that are running in this massive dual-core Java GL processor thing somewhere else, you know, like in the cheap, scalable cloud meta infrastructure, right? But they don't. Where is your address book? Well, of course, it's on your device, right? Because otherwise, you have to lean out of the window like this to get a signal so you can call on the landline when it's not working, right? You know, and there's too many people died doing that. So they, they, they put it on the device, right? Um, and, and similarly, they put, you know, just increasing amounts on this thing. This device starts to look like a laptop in your, in your pocket. Um, and then they turn it into a laptop, but hey. And yeah, you have this huge Flash player running. I mean, if you can run the Flash player on your phone, you know, the, it must have some serious horsepower in it. And, the, you know, your, your GPU has more transistors than you do and all of that sort of thing. So yeah, none of it's in the cloud. Funny, isn't it? So here's how we're doing it in LibreOffice. We're basically reusing as much as possible. 95% uh, of the code is shared across, uh, across these things. Oh, there's even a laser pointer thing here somewhere. I'll try not to kill someone in the crowd. Wait a minute. Um. Ooh, what did that do? Oh, that's the kill your laptop button. Oh, well, that does. Oh, well. Um, but either way, if you remember the picture that was on the screen before I, I pressed the kill button, um, uh, then uh, you'll, does that, uh, oh, oh, it came back, perfect. Now, which is the laser one, tell me? Oh, the middle, right, right, stay away. Perfect, so, um, so the web office here, of course, uh, you know, shares everything. So that's one of, one of the interesting things about this box is that most web office suites that you look at, you immediately cut features out, like that's it, you know, well, by the way, you can't do WYSIWYG, and you can't do this, and you can't do that, and you can't do redlining, and you can't do change tracking, and you can't do, you know, powerful tables, and you can't do nested this, and you can't do that, right? It's a web office suite. Right? That's what you do. Well, look at this one. It's got everything. It is the most powerful suite. In fact, if you look at LibreOffice as we install it, we don't even have the help embedded. You know, you have to go online to get the help in 108 languages or whatever we support. Because it's that big and it's that infrequently used that it's not worth having on your device. So that's interestingly different. 
about this approach. And of course, you've got the traditional model that has a bit of clip art and templates, but maybe not all of it. And then we you know, cut it right down for a small viewing uh, or uh, minimal editing device on the handset. So it's a crazy plan. Well, is it possible? How can you have the same thing running on like your this tiny device and also this you know, great big PC? It's just impossible, right? Well, yeah, nice. Except the kernel you know, is running on the phone and things that are smaller, and also your, your supercomputers, right? So in theory, this is possible. Whether practically it is, who knows? And of course, sharing code base. You know, when you fix your rendering bug, it's fixed everywhere, which is nice. When you add your new UI feature, it's there everywhere. Uh, your interoperability fixes, blah, blah, blah. They, they happen everywhere. And your performance wins. You know, you speed up one, you speed up the rest. And th there are other joys, really. I mean, uh, yeah, you can, of course, build and debug your thing on the really fast hardware and before you run it on the, the really lame hardware. I and mean, incidentally, people who claim that writing millions of lines of JavaScript and running it in your phone, having jitted a type unsafe language, where you can add members to structs after you've jitted it, you know, I mean, this is, anyway, it's going to perform really wonderfully, you know, and this is going to be much better than native code. I think are in la-la land with a vengeance. So there you are. If you say them, shake, see them, shake their hand. They need help. Um, so interoperability, okay, you fix everything, UI improvements. So th the other thing is that, that these devices are becoming remarkably similar. So on the, on the left-hand side, you see I've stolen Intel's beautiful app up artwork. And uh, 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 Ultrabook, I like. Look at this slim, you know, it's slim, right? And on the other side, we have um, uh, an Android thing. And they look so different, right? Don't they? You know, like there's a keyboard, there's a touch screen. You know, it's just a totally different device segment, the tablet. Anyway, so there's, there's a degree of convergence. We have to do a whole lot of this work anyway to get touch enabled and make the Office Suite work well with, with touch. So, performance. Yeah, yeah, there's all these beautiful, beautiful um, limitations you come across. Android's linker is particularly special. Um, yeah, only 40, yeah, so you can only link 96 shared libraries into your application. We have a shared library problem from, you know, meta-componentizing everything in the past. And so we're trying to de-meta-componentize. And uh, this is one of the things that will help drive that, I hope. Um, and uh, just a side effect of doing that work, though, actually Google Summer Code funded uh, a chunk of this, and a chap called Mattis Kukan, uh, means that we'll be lumping more into one library so we can link time optimize it and make it faster for everyone. So the work we do on that Android device actually will help everyone get a faster, smaller, more efficient LibreOffice. And you start to notice things like, you know, this 15% of your CPU startup is parsing config. And the first look, 20% of the config is parsing label descriptions or page things. No one ever, well, someone uses it clearly, otherwise we wouldn't have the feature. But it's a really a 0.1% minority use case. And we're doing it in every startup for everyone. Why? Um, and there's more that we can do in terms of accelerating our page rendering and panning so that we do less, less rendering. So, um, yeah, LibreOffice Online. Perfect. Let me see how the time is going. Oh, I can slow down. Perfect. So we're rendering using a web canvas. It's HTML5 compliant, compatible, which is good, right? Really? HTML5. Communicating, we use WebSockets, and I just finished getting the WebSocket v7 version working recently, so it actually works in modern browsers as well as ancient ones. And so we have this just very simple plain text protocol. And we shove compressed pings across for updating the screens. And yeah, we can see what's re-rendered as we type. I'll show you a demo in a second. But as we type, although we will see quite a big box being re-rendered around what we're doing, actually we're only sending this little guy that we actually changed, and we're only sending a, a compressed version of that. So it does a delta as you go. And as you scroll, it's doing copy areas as well. So it's relatively efficient. Um, and we use that GTK 3's Broadway backend to do that. Um, and so, yeah, all of the intelligence, all of the work is on the server. And the client is being a dumb client. It's perhaps not the best use of transistors. You've got lots of transistors doing nothing in your client. Uh, but then you don't have to write a lot of JavaScript, so that's good. And it's still a prototype. Yeah, I can't emphasize this enough. Hopefully, we'll show you some good bugs later. And uh, yeah, it gives you, as I say, this full feature experience. We see we're editing, edit your footnotes, you know, pivot tables, macros. And there's some API challenges there that were just not addressed. So let me, let me see if I can make the, uh, the demo work. So uh -huh, here we are. So this is uh, LibreOffice in the browser. And um, I don't know, have you ever used LibreOffice? You know, hello world, this sort of thing. So there have been some nice new UI changes recently. Um, so there's this, this beautiful thing here so you can create headers. I don't know if you can see the, you know, this is a header. Although most people really want just the field numbers in there. So, you know, you can put a field and uh, put a page number. 
Aha. So if you've ever wondered how to get a page number in, uh, in LibreOffice, you know, this is, this is pretty much it. That's how you do it. Beautiful, huh? Um, so that usability improvement of the click, add, what you see is what you get stuff is, of course, immediately applied to the web app as well. It's uh, you know, just entirely shared code, which is kind of nice. So what else can we do? Um, yeah, the screen is kind of small. Maybe I should have resized that window. Demo, uh, uh, this is a puzzle. Let's see if we get anything. No. Hmm. It's important to practice your demos in advance. Otherwise, you know, people will think you're um, silly. Very silly. Uh, perfect. So what do we have here? Oh, this is a picture of my wife. This is clear proof that uh, you know, working on LibreOffice increases your chances in the marriage market. Look at that. Isn't it beautiful? Uh, in case you needed that, obviously, I would say it's kind of obvious, but um, there you go. So uh, what, what can we do here? You know, there's this, all this beautiful text wrapping stuff you know, here. So I, I don't know if we can move this guy over here, and we can... Mm, crikey. And he's moved off the top now. I don't know. Yeah, it's not as usable as all that, is it? Let's face it. Um, so I think some of these window metaphors really need a bit of love, but uh, we, can, we can move this chap around in theory, and then we could press the apply button, um, and we could get rid of that. In which case, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to abandon ship on this one, because that doesn't look like it's going to happen very well. Oh, perfect. It's gone away. Nah. No, it's back again now. But I, I can move this chap around, and when I apply him, let's draw a little bit over here. And hopefully that'll uh, stick out and cause grief for the mm, other stuff. Ah, yeah. So you can see this is a real demo, right? You know, there's no, there's no hacks here. You know? Let me restart this, because then you can see all the printouts scrolling like that, which I, I find it you know, reassuring. The other nice thing is the... Ooh! No? No? What? How fascinating. Mm. Tell you what, I will not show you my macro demo just now, because it looks like... Mm, this is not having a good day, which is a shame. But hey, you nearly saw this, and then you nearly saw the macros running, right? Hmm. Okay, claps, applause. You know? Go on, thank you. I tried. You know, I tried. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I was up until very late the night before last working on the Android port, which is even more flaky. But we'll sh we'll see that in a minute. Um, but the nice thing is, of course, you can run your VBA macros. You know, if you have your um, enterprise that really doesn't uh, use much stuff. And we, we talk to businesses that, um, you know, they don't really want to install an office suite on lots of machines because they actually only use a few documents and only in a few random timesheet filling type applications. And it's a pain in the backside to, uh, to have to deploy this thing and manage it. So they quite like that, uh, a central management thing. So then there's the it can't possibly scale argument. Oh, I'm really annoyed about that. I should really, really let, me, let me just fiddle around with it again. You know, maybe we can get some something funny to happen instead, right? Uh, no, I'm not going to kill all of those. Did I actually get rid of it? Yes, I did. Uh-huh. Maybe this... I'm going to blame the browser. So why would that be there? I mean, you know, how can it... Oh, well, anyway. Um, so maybe if I can type some things... Mm -hmm. So I can turn on the, the re-rendering support. So you can see as I type that uh, it is re-rendering stuff like this, okay? which is kind of nice. Um, of course, it only re-renders the bit that uh, I'm actually caring about, which is, which is kind of good. Uh, so you can see that. Let me see if I can get the VBA demo to work, because that's actually quite fun. And it's branded. It's very important to be fully branded, you know? Uh, here we go. So there's a little button here, and you know, you've got this. This is a VBA macro, and you, know, you, can, you can run it, and you can play those you know, productivity-enhancing games that uh, you know, are so key to our modern enterprise system. And, ugh! I should get something, you know, look at that, don't you think? Oh. I don't know. So, you know, while the uh, Android virtual machine is uh, building itself, you can do that, you know, so it takes a little while. Anyhow, so whether it can possibly scale. Um, so LibreOffice, you know, in a multi-user, well, we already do this for, for remote X. Uh, so, you know, so here are the, the names carefully scrubbed out of the people that happen to be typing at that minute. Um, but there's, you know, this is 73 live users and 10 people in writer and 10 in calc. And this is on, you know, some pretty beefy hardware. And this is what the sysadmin guesses he'll get out of that. Um, if rented servers truly are cheaper, if they truly are cheaper than, you know, lots of cheap laptops, um, then why doesn't it, you know, make sense? So that's the thought. So show me the code. Well, it's all there. It's, it ships out of the box. People m put nasty things on Twitter saying, where's the code? Because they haven't looked in master and discovered it's all in the main branch. And so here it is. It ships out of the box. And um, it even works on a, a reasonably modern operating system. You need some updates to 12, SUSE 12.1 to do it. And that's it. Hacking help is needed. 
Um, the, the basic way it works is that um, our VCL rendering, our class libraries, used to render uh, using X directly. So although you got the GTK theming of things, all of the lines and pixels on the screen were hammered on one by one using the old X API, you know? Allocate a color, you know? Oh, I want to allocate black. Oh, I got some black. Excellent. Draw on the screen with it. You know, all of those beautiful, crisp, modern APIs. And um, so to port to this, we had to throw all that away and do some more heavy-duty lifting for client-side uh, rendering. But that's, that's working reasonably well. And yeah, and you don't even need the browser to, to find the GTK3 bugs. But why, 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 would you need to, uh, why would you need to do this? I mean, you could just use VNC, right? Or you could use uh, the Java VNC or the VNC JavaScript version or, or whatever in your, in your browser. And that's a good question. I think uh, we clearly want to be moving to a place where you, you have a service that renders pages and that you can do a lot more from JavaScript with them. In theory, we have this beautiful programming model so that you, know, you can do you know, component magic on everything. And, and, and create and automate your document. And there's really no reason why that can't be done from the client side in the browser. So talking to the remote, the remote server to script it and create forms and fields and layouts and embed them in pages and do things in pretty sexy ways. So hopefully that'd be good. Um, so yes. So Android. Yes. I think the fakes thing is uh, copy and paste from a previous uh, thing. So ignore that. So I'm a fraud. I would just point out that all the heavy lifting here was done by the man with the beer. Not the beard. Actually, he has a beard as well. So um, Tor Lilkvist is just a genius. He, he ported GTK to Windows and maintained that for many years. But uh, yeah, and this really came out of our cross-compiling work. So we're doing a whole lot of work to cross-compile LibreOffice for Windows primarily. Uh, Windows is just a disaster of a platform to build for, you know? Uh, getting repeatable builds where repeatable means you know, you start from the bare metal and you get a build that's exactly the same. It's really, really not pleasant. And so large amounts of Windows software you buy, some idiot has clicked buttons in a user interface, you know, click, 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 drag and drop from the release build somewhere else. You know, it's at this level of quality. And we don't like that. We want to click a button and minutes later to have an entire clean rebuild of LibreOffice. And so uh, a large amount of work's being done here, in part by Tor, in part by Kendi, who's sitting at the front here, to cross-compile to Windows. Um, also because it takes about 45, 30 minutes, 25 minutes on one of these 64 CPU monsters that we have in the labs to compile from clean the whole thing, whereas on Windows you're talking six to eight hours. So quite a, quite a serious difference. Um, so that's pretty good. So just out of the cross-compiling work falls the fact that you can cross-compile to ARM from Mac or to Mac from ARM. Or, yeah, I, I don't know, all, all these kind of weird combinations. It's extremely useful for Android and for iOS and so on. Um, and there's really a lot of interesting new things to do. If you want to play with Android and really get some experience of it, you know, do, do uh, just get stuck in. It's, it's, I have this branch here, Feature Android. There's not much in it uh, in terms of patches, but um, it's pretty cool. We're getting somewhere. And I was going to, yeah, well, there'll be some kind of live demo. It's not going to be very good. Let me, uh, let me try. And the the orangey stuff is just an uh, artifact of I wanted to get something on the screen. So I wrote a silly loop that, uh, that dumped junk in it. And uh, we managed to get the fonts working. So look at this. This is, this, is before, this is improvement. Look from there, no fonts, to here with fonts. Look at that. I don't know. And uh, let's see if the emulator is actually going to wake up. You must bear in mind that this is uh, an emulated ARM device. Oh, it did. Look at that. And I press tab. And if I'm lucky, oh, I get a menu. I've never got a menu before. Oh, and it crashed. Awesome. Awesome. So you like my demo? Look at that. You know, hey, hey. And you get all sorts of debug down here as well. Look at that. I might try running it again. Let me see. I'll point out that Kendi was finding my ridiculous programming errors uh, last night there. So one of the nice things about Android is you can't attach the debugger to start with. Um, you can't run the app in the debugger. You have to run the app and then attach the debugger. But if the app's crashed before you attach the debugger, you don't, can't debug anything, right? So there's all of this, let's add a really big sleep right at the beginning, which seems like a good idea, except you can, can't see debug symbols for apps that load off, libraries that load after you attach the debugger. It's a bit of a pain. But everyone's using it, so we, we, have, to, uh, we have to make it work. So I'm going I'm to say that uh, for now that's not working, but we can get writer, and it looks pretty cool. Of course, it looks totally lame for, for an Android app, right? You, you don't want to be typing into this guy, unless you happen to have one of those keyboard ones that looks just like a normal laptop, right? Because it's not too terribly bad in that circumstance. And um, 
Yeah, so, so there's a whole load of the, the same work that we need in the web world to get pages rendering into textures and flipping around and zoom, pinch to zoom and so on, and putting little, little UI shells around this to make it actually work. So that is that, and that's not the end point. Yeah, you'll be pleased to know that. Um, so uh, we need this J Java native wrapper to, to make this work well, and I think we're targeting this you know, high fidelity viewer first so that we can yeah, see documents. There's nothing really that will render your nice weirdo Microsoft documents with those funny features inside and the smart art and the odd custom shapes and so on, as well as doing your ODF and doing your, well, even more exotic Corel weirdo file formats and so on. So hopefully we can provide something useful there. And in the same pass, shrink it, make it smaller and faster and more efficient uh, for everyone. So. There we are, there's lots of scope there. And there are lots of other mobile targets as well. I mean, Android just happens to be easier uh, than others to develop for. So that's pretty much the, uh, the random uh, you know, excursions into crazy hacks. Um, I prefer to talk about 3.5.0, actually, but uh, let's see if we've got some time for that. So it's out next week, which is good. And uh, the key point is that there's whole loads of cool volunteers have been working on this. So here's a graph of it. Um, I like to admit what the scale actually means on the left-hand side. I think that's very helpful for people. Um, this is the number of people committing code in a given month. So you can see as the months go on. We lost Oracle. I guess that's the big red thing here. But that was kind of inevitable. So we're doing well, growing, and producing lots of nice features. So one of the things are the Germans here. Do we have any Germans that have crept in? Does so anyone speak German vaguely? Aha, good, perfect. People at the back, good, more, more. It's fine to be German, honestly. These, these people have a special mission in, 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 in LibreOffice because uh, we have lots of German comments. And I heard this pit, you know, plaintive plea earlier from our, our writer maintainer who has to wade through all of this layout code, which is not particularly beautiful. Please, please come and translate the comments in the layout code in writer. Anyhow, we're making some good progress here. We managed to translate 20,000 lines of German comment as found by the tool in the last two, uh, two releases. So these wonderful people. And you know, we only have 32,000 to go, so the, the job is nearly done. You know, if you don't join now, you know, it could be your chance for glory. It could be finished. Um, so yeah, if you speak German, please help. Um, other things we're doing is removing code that's never actually run. Um, so we have a brilliant tool written by Quaylon that can uh, definitively prove that this code is never actually run. It's not linked. It's not even, there's no pointers to it anyway. So we're doing pretty well. We had 5,000 plus methods we knew weren't ever executed, and we've managed to get this down to you know, 16, 1650. So this task is coming to an end, but there's still some fun to be had there too. So here are some other features that have been put in. This guy is actually a hero. He, he's written, so we never had a grammar checker for a long time. It turns out that um, just before Novell bought Zimian, they sold the grammar checker that Novell had to Microsoft. So Microsoft's grammar checker is actually sort of Novell technology that we could have open sourced had we not foolishly sold it just before. But anyway, apart from these kind of historical sadnesses, um, we have now this Python grammar checker that's pretty cool, well, as I wrote. And um, he's also done some pretty nice typography things, making um, LibreOffice much better for, for desktop publishing and doing some really uh, pretty font, font work. Hopefully, uh, I'll be appreciated by people. Um, what else do we have? Oh, yeah, if you like game theory, I don't know if you like game theory, you know, we should nuke the Russians immediately. I think von Neumann was very up for that. I don't know, that's a very good application of game theory. But, but anyway, if you like that sort of thing, um, Olivia has been making your life beautiful. Um, if you're uh, from an Asian area, you know, uh, much improved RTL uh, stuff, which is cool. Uh, what else? Oh, improved conditional formatting. Did I mention all these are volunteers who just showed up and, and came and contributed cool stuff? Um, anyone that's ever saved in a Microsoft format using OpenOffice would have been presented with a question they can't possibly answer. And, you know, um, would you not like to not save it in the other format that whatever, you know? So there's this keep current format, which you don't know what it is, but they, you know, you chose it. And then save it. So it's all been changed, like, you know, use Microsoft Word 2000, whatever, use ODF format. So hopefully the annoyance factor is slightly reduced. Very easy patch. Cool guy, done by volunteers, uh, came along. What, what about this one? There's a thing called Microsoft Visio you can buy if you, you know, have a small fortune. And um, now we import it. If you watch carefully, we'll switch to the other version. Right. Let me do that again. Let me see. Boop. Boop. I personally like it without the grid. I think it's an improvement. But so there's a huge amount of work being done there, and that's really cool. And there are pictures of the people actually doing it here at the party in Paris. You know, if you go to a party in Paris, you should be hacking on Visio import. 
Uh, so uh, Valek and Friedrich and uh, Tibi Little have been doing that. That's exceedingly cool. What else? Lionel Eli Maman, I've missed an L out of his name, it seems. This is a bass maintainer. And he's doing a great job of improving bass, which is pretty buggy, our database piece, along with help from, from other people doing some fantastic things there. Marcus Mohar at the bottom is also awesome. And many of these people will be speaking, actually, in our dev room, which you're missing now, sadly. It's kind of the same day. You should, should try it out. And not only has he gone and improved calc performance a whole lot, but he's also built our unit test framework almost well, not, not single-handedly, lots of other people have helped, but he's done a huge amount, being the driving force behind hundreds, if not thousands, of unit tests, exercising huge proportions of the code, which we now um, run many of them during compile. So you can't even get away with compiling the thing without running the unit tests. Oh, and incidentally, many of, though the UI may be all belts and mm, duct tape, most of these run on Androids and just work. So we're, we're confident that the core engine is working uh, really well. So yeah. As you compile it, imports, calculates, and checks the spreadsheets, you may think that's a waste of your CPU. But since it takes you know, 45 minutes to compile, we think we can spend another two to three minutes checking that it actually compiled something that runs. So that's pretty good. We even uh, imported all our old CVE bugs, you know, those security bugs, and discovered that many of them had regressed. So we now import all of those during you know, compile as well and make sure that, in fact, we're still secure. So that's pretty cool. Here's not done by volunteers. It's done by Radek Dulik. Um, this is how we used to import our custom shapes. It should look like that, which is what it looks like in 3.5. I don't know if you noticed the difference. Um, kind of profound. And with that, we can start to import smart art. So there is this beautiful feature in Microsoft Office that does this diagram creation stuff. And we can now uh, start to import those things so your slides don't have big holes in them where the smart art used to be. What else? OK, yeah, and there's lots of uh, QA and bug fixing. Reiner is uh, was doing some fantastic work here in producing metrics of you know bug fixing and bug counts, and we've even managed to get our filed bug rate to plat you know, open bug count to plateau, which is pretty, uh, pretty encouraging. So we're managing to, to start to fix as many bugs that are filed. And with your help, we could even drive that thing down so that uh, you know, it's, it's dead, which would be great. So what are my conclusions? I can't believe it. I did a 34-minute talk. Is that right? Instead of a 50-minute one. OK, well, we'll have to revisit some of this. So here are the conclusions. Code sharing is nearly the silver bullet. You know, if you want a silver bullet, if you haven't read Fred Books' book, you should read Fred Books' book, the second edition. It's very good. Um, it's profoundly better than the first edition, in my view. But read the introduction to see why. Um, code sharing is nearly the silver bullet that kills the werewolf of complexity, etc. Uh, rewriting a huge office suite is a pointless waste of time. It doesn't work. We have all of these historical examples of it not working. It's, it's a silly thing to, to suggest doing. LibreOffice is really getting a lot better. It's actually fun to hack on. It's a project people can be excited about belonging to and doing stuff. And because so many people use it, your small fix there has a huge impact on lots of people. And all those people struggling writing slides for their conference, you know, are, are slightly less annoyed when they, when they come to project them, you know? All, all, all of that good stuff. Um, of course, the online port, the, the Android thing is, is useful in many senses. It needs more work, as you see. Um, if you can help out with that, that's much appreciated. Do come and see me. Um, and you know, thank you for all your help and support. We, as LibreOffice, are up against some you know, pretty substantial corporate interests uh, that are fairly entrenched. And we simply could not do it without the volunteers who, who give their time and, and their passion to the project and make it something exciting. So thank you uh, for helping with that. And please do get involved and help us. And are there any questions? That's, that's where I'm at. Oh, there's a man at the back here. Go for it, sir. I think the question was about IBM Lotus Symphony and giving things back to the community, yeah? <coughs> That's a brilliant question. If you read the news, you would be forgiven for thinking that there was actually some code being contributed back. Yeah. Um, for many years, and, and now about, I can't, is it five years? Or, or, or I don't know, it's, it's really quite a long time. There's been a great deal of talk about code being contributed back by IBM. And I, I, I applaud the day when it actually occurs. Uh, as yet, it still hasn't. So, but the same thing has been announced again and again and again and again to the point that there's kind of this punch drunk, you know, when are you going to re-announce that, you know, Symphony is being donated to Apache or it's all going to be open now. We're all going to release our code. We're going to play nicely, honestly, and, and so on. And may maybe they will. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to prejudge them and say they're not going to because they might, you know? Um, 
So we'll see. We'll see. And if they do, that's great. We we can we can incorporate all code that's you know compatibly licensed and. One of the sad things to me personally, because I've invested quite a chunk of my life, well, a, chunk, uh, nah, a, a small sliver of my life, on accessibility and I'm trying to make accessibility really good, is that one of the elite secret cool technologies that they have, which actually makes a real difference for the visually impaired, is iAccessible2 support, which is meaningless to Linux guys, but on Windows, this makes accessibility much better for the Office suite, much faster, much smaller, without a Java bridge in between. And we haven't seen this, and it's been promised you know, to be donated in a functioning, working state we can include uh, for, for years. And I, and I, I, that's a shame. It's not stylish. Yeah. So that's a good question. Thank you. Sorry the answer's not a kind of smiley one. But. So. What about the, 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 the yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So of course, draw has a gallery. So in theory, you know, in theory, it's all done already. Like if you want, if you want the box checking mentality, you know, haha, we well already do that. But actually, you're right. It's just lame to use. So if you uh, if you create a drawing like this, then we can do tools gallery, and in theory, you can have all sorts of clip art things in here that you can drag and drop into there, which can include, um, you know, shapes with callouts and connection points and so on. You know. In fact, we made our connection points look a lot better in this, this version. Let's get rid of that eyesore. And uh, let's have a, uh, uh, one of these guys. So yeah, but, um, if I start to draw lines, I think, yeah, so you can see these connectors now look sort of um, prettier, maybe. Bigger, bigger, bolder, nicer alpha uh, shapes. So all of that's there, but it's not easy to use. I completely agree. How difficult is it to turn all of the functionality that's already there into something with a few palettes to allow people to do that to make it easier? Not very difficult. Not something our customers ask us for. But it would be awesome if you helped with it. So yeah, you know, it, it's, it's not a big programming task, I think. Um, so yeah, and hopefully the Visio work will see that because people import their beautiful network diagram and they want to put another computer in, right? Or whatever. Okay. Yeah, the problem is that they always say, but only if, and then there's one of three things, like it needs an email client, it needs a project management software, it needs a media player, it needs a, you know, uh, drive my car. So there's always some excuse for not using free software. I, I agree this is a useful feature to have. Yes, and to draw, it will. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. So brilliant. This is a volunteer project. It's not like in the past where there was one big corporate entity behind it that did everything and you could be angry with them if they didn't do what you wanted. Um, there's no one like that now, so it's just us. So if we want the, if we want the feature, we get to do it. So see me afterwards. I'll show you some code pointers. I'll help you. I will, I will invest my life in making your project succeed. And that, that's all we can do, you know, to try and, try and help other people make a success of their contribution. Seriously, you know, or find someone that you would be interested in hacking at. It's a cool idea. I totally agree. We need, we need something that will draw draw diagrams and make it easy to do, for sure. Someone else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, that's a good question. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. How why does it have to be so big? So you sort of answered your question. So the question is, is it significant removing unused code? I think, basically, and how significant? That's a good question. I didn't put that in my slide. I think last time I did the metrics, we do have... 8 million lines of code, 500,000 methods, uh, 5,000 unused, or whatever, 1%. The problem is that every 1% that you save uh, adds up after a while. And yeah, it's, it's a worthwhile thing. It makes it easy to look at the code. It makes it easy to read. It makes it easy to get grep for the thing you want without getting three other things you could change that aren't actually executed ever. You know, um, this, this sort of thing. The other thing that's interesting is as we remove more unused code, we discover more unused code. So the thing is not completely accurate. You know, so, uh, and the unused code also tends to be the oldest 
or in some cases, the oldest, least pleasant code. So I think it's a, it's a virtuous thing to do to make the thing clean. It does make it slightly smaller. There's lots more that we can do to make it smaller uh, that will be helpful. But uh, hopefully the, the mobile device thing will really drive that because there isn't so much resource. And we really have to get eager, you know, hungry for, uh, for performance improvements. So yeah, did that help? Perfect. Anyone else? We have 10 minutes. Aha, go for it. <laughs> Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, um, the, so, so basically, I think, so Kendi here is very interested in um, fixing UI things, and so he, um, he has a project to fix lots of little annoyances. You know, if you read the Joel on software, you know, barrels of dough thing, and slipping over, and then tripping, and then stepping over the thing, and, you know, uh, at the end of the day, this is not usable, right? So we're, we're trying to fix, you know, remove some of the, the bumps and the steps and the falling masonry and, and so on. Because um, they ruin the experience. Um, yeah, and so, so there's a lot of little things like that happening around the place. Um, but some of the bigger things were, yeah, that, that, that header thing so that, you know, you can, um, you can create, yeah, those, those headings much more easily. Let me try and zoom out. Because um, that turns out that something people really suffered with creating. And if we're lucky, um, it'll work for me. There's, there's also a page break. Uh, oh, actually, it's not in this version, so that would probably explain why it's not there. Um, let me try another one. I think this browser one, if I can get it to work. Uh, had it. The Android. Oh, I won the puzzle. Oh, I see. It just popped up behind. Brilliant. Um, let, me, let me kill this browser thing and do um, one here, and we'll see. That was quite quick, huh? Do you think we're improving our performance, startup performance? I hope so. Maybe it's having an SSD. I don't know. That uh, might help. Um, so, yeah, so, so that, that's part of it. But there's also this, um, uh, you know, if you insert a page break, you know, have this page break line that you can click on and do, you know, this sort of thing um, to try and make, make it cleaner inside the document. So you see your page break where the page break is, not this sort of funny character in the document, which is uh, kind of nice. There's also some work to, to make the page markers, oh, I don't know. There's so many things happening and so many people doing it, it's kind of hard to to say, is there anything that you particularly loathe in our user interface that you'd want fixed? You know, the <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so we, we have this thing called the Easy Hacks project where we try and encourage people to get in. So what we would do is we wouldn't necessarily fix it, but we'd write a clear description of how to fix it. And then often people come in and are like, ah, oh, I did this, free liner. And, you know, having pointed someone to it, it's easy for them to do it and see it and get the, you know, the achievement uh, hit and, and be encouraged to do more. So... Uh, yeah, yeah, so we're trying that. And we have an intern who's been doing a whole load of um, yeah, improving the glue points, rendering. Uh, what, what has he been doing? What's Tim been doing, Kendi? Tell me. You see, on the spot. There we go. But yeah, lots and lots of little, little features. I mean, one thing Kendi did was the searching, you know, so you can now do Control F and you can type you know, down here and actually have a reasonable search thing. Now, the problem is Control G, which as everyone knows, should search for the next thing, doesn't. So, you know, easy. How hard can that be? There's even a button here that does it. It just needs a binding adding so that it will search for the next one, right? And behave as Firefox does, which, as everyone knows, is the right way to do it. So, yeah. So, uh, there's, there's lots of things that can be done there. How are we doing? End of time? Oh, gentleman here. And should that be the last one? No, we have two more. You. Oh. You're surrounded by Microsoft users. Will your situation improve in the near future? I don't know. That really depends on them, doesn't it? Um, so <laughs> you could move. Um, I don't know. Uh, so you know, clearly, we are trying to make LibreOffice the most compelling and and performant and attractive Office suite that you can get on every device form factor, and get as many people sharing work on that core, so that maybe the next three web startups that use LibreOffice. Only two of them succeed, but at least the other one really helps improve the core. And the next five device operating systems for handhelds, four of which will fail, um, also help improve the core so that the code gets better and better. You know, and get all of these people excited about improving the product. So, and I think it can be done. I, I don't think there is anything that I see in Microsoft Office as software that is that much of a problem to take down. I, I don't think it's a problem chasing the tail lights. The problem I see is only in the ecosystem of, of getting people to sell it. And so there's some good work there being done by Atalo to build certification programs for 
you know, mum and pop shops and, and people who want to support and resell support for LibreOffice so we get a quality experience. Uh, and so we build the brand and make people think, actually, LibreOffice is really good. If I get support for it, it will be good quality support. I'm not going to be sold a, you know, a duff one. Um, so we're trying in all of these ways to build the ecosystem, but it, it's, a, it's work. So get involved, and it'll happen quicker. How about that? One more? Last question? Aha, back to you. That's a brilliant question again. Yeah. So the question was Alfresco and document management systems. So there's a thing called CMIS, which is a protocol for talking to wonderful document management systems. And there's a lot of interest in SharePoint. I'm sorry to say that many people out there in the real world, however real that is, are using SharePoint servers and building their business process around it that ties client office suite and server together in a very frightening way to get rid of. And so we are doing some work, and there's a guy we just hired, in fact, Miklos, who has written a SharePoint integration thing. It's in Java. So there's a slight damper on the enthusiasm. But, but it's, it's, you know, it, it does some useful things if you have SharePoint. Better than the web, a horrible web interface. So you're getting, getting those problems solved is clearly important for us, and we want, to, uh, we want to fix those. And Alfresco happens to use the same protocols, so it should just work. Cool. Well, you've been very patient. Thank you for your time, and I hope to see you next year.